Let's go ahead to that 18th and 19th verse. I'm going to read it, please. Okay. Yeah, that's the Now we see here Paul the Apostle is very specific. He's saying, didn't do anything. Uh, when I was in the temple, I was not causing a riot. Remember on last time, that was one of the things they said. He was causing a riot. Everywhere he went, he would cause a riot. Now it is true, riots would come up, but he wasn't the cause of it. It was the enemy that was doing all kinds of things to try to get him killed. If you look at that commentary with regard to the fourth charge, namely that he had profaned the temple, Paul made this reply. While he was in the act of bringing offerings to the temple in the performance of a Jewish vow, certain Jews from Asia found him and accused him of taking unclean Gentiles into the temple. This wasn't true. We read through that. He was doing everything properly uh, according to the law. This, of course, was not true. The apostle was alone at the time and had been purified from ceremony defilement. These accusing Jews from Asia who caused the riot against him in Jerusalem ought to have come to Caesarea uh, to accuse him if they had anything against him. He's saying, if you, didn't, if you didn't like me, why weren't they here? Why weren't they bringing those charges? Why weren't they the ones that were standing up? We've got these other people that don't even know what went on. If my accusers are real, let them stand before me. And so this whole process is going, and Felix, he's listening, trying to decide which way he's going to go. So I'm going to go ahead and read those next couple of verses. What one statement? What, what did he say? What's the one statement? Resurrection of the dead. I'm telling you, like the more I'm learning about Christ, this is key, this is critical. There are a lot of teachers, you know, talking about faith, you're talking about you can get this and get that and all of that. But when you leave out the resurrection, you've lost, you lost everything. That's what Paul the Apostle hinges his whole life. You hear him constantly coming back here. You don't hear all this other stuff. You hear about the resurrection, what Jesus Christ did. That is the whole hint. If you don't have that in your life, if you don't have an encounter with Jesus Christ, you're not saved. Christ is our everything, and from there, everything flows out. So go ahead and read that commentary, please. I mean, if they would examine us in detail, if they would go through all what we said, and no. how we drove today and last week, and everything, could we be convicted of anything? Yes. All right. Well, let's go back. I know some of y'all be so sanctified, holy. Let's go back about 20 years, 30 years. Find some stuff that you ain't got caught for. You know, every now and then you kind of look over your shoulder when the police would come, and like, they find me. <laughs> that they find me. We all, there's all, all of us have fallen short. Paul the Apostle is so amazing here simply because he says, you know what, the, what I'm being convicted for is loving Jesus. Preaching the resurrection. That's what I'm being convicted for. Now, I don't see that too often. I just don't see it too often. But here we see a man of God loving the Lord with his whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And there's a price for it. 
The price is he is suffering. But it's a good news. That, that's the whole flip side of it. He learned when he was weak, then was he strong. Look as we continue on. Maybe we can still listen to this. Uh, 22nd verse I'm going to read. I've been here, um, not necessarily with me, but I've been sitting in uh, courtrooms, everything has been out, and I can tell the judge was indecisive, he didn't want to make a decision. So what he would do is, put it off. We'll hear, we'll hear this case later, and some of you have done, well, there's not enough evidence, or I don't feel I'm the one to make this decision, so we're going to adjourn it right now, and we're going to bring it back later. All it is is a stall tactic. They don't want to take responsibility for whatever judgment they want to get out because other people have been speaking into their ear. And we see this whole process here. As Felix has been listening, he's thinking about the political ramifications if he lets Paul go. There's always politics that are going on when you get at those high levels of government. He's like, if I let Paul go, then i got to deal with these Jewish leaders. Uh, they held some power within the government also. And so he's trying to figure out a way now, how can I still be in charge, but not really deal with it? Look at that first part. Go ahead and read that first part of the commentary. Okay. And this is key, as we've said before. How many things in our lives have been, we've made a decision to do it, not because it was right, but because of what it was going to cost me. I, I, a simple thing that comes from my taxes. You know, a lot of times we make a, you make a decision that's wrong simply because you're like, man, if I tell the truth, all the truth, I'm going to have to pay more money. But if I just kind of fudge on this, then I'll be okay. And, and, and because the pressure, we got pressure from all, and there have been a lot of things, especially when you start reading the Bible and trying to walk like the Lord, when you're trying to make some decisions to stand for the Lord, it can be tough. And that pressure from the outside sometimes uh, can cause us to conform. But here at this point, we see Felix, he's like, okay, he's, he's innocent, but what am I going to do? Go ahead and read that next part. So at this point, as we just think about that, he chose wrong because of what? Because he wanted to avoid the wrath of the Jews. And I'm just wondering how many times in our lives do we choose the wrong way just because we don't want to be ostracized? Just because we want to fit in. Just because we want to see be seen as cool or hip or whatever. This political pressure, I've seen it. I've seen it also, I've seen it in our government now. I've seen um, great leaders that I thought were great leaders conform. Because they were thinking about their career and they're like, man, if, if, if I make this decision, which is my heart, it was obviously a heart before, if I make this decision, I may not get reelected. Man, I am, I'm, I'm getting more excited about people that will risk it all, that will stand up with their convictions, whether you like them or not, at least you know where they stand, and, and lay it all down, because, you know, this political season, all this stuff, they're going to fail you anyway. People like that who are your friends, all because they're connected on a political level, they're not really your friends anyway. Sooner or later, they're going to drop you. So you may as well go with the convictions of your heart. And we see Felix here, um, he's compromising. Yes, sir. You're right, Brother Avon. Pontius Pilate, same thing, broke under pressure. 
how many of us can stand under pressure? And, and you're like, yeah, hallelujah. I love the Lord. I can have these back to church. I am strong in the Lord. The issue with pressure is you don't know if you're going to stand until you put pressure on That's the issue. You can say, oh, I'll never do that. I've learned to stop saying that and just say, Lord, what's your grace? I need your grace and mercy. Because pressure does a lot of things. Yes, sir. Correct. You're right. And yes, everybody was scratching everybody's back. That's just the way it was. Without Christ, you do whatever you can do to keep your political stand, keep everything cushy, everything going the way you want to do. Of course, and we're going to find that out about some of the leaders. They were already get rampant sin in their lives. So. To, to stand for truth at this point was going to cause other problems that they had already compromised in. Go ahead and read that last part. You remember Lysias? You know, he was the one that got caught up in this and pulled Paul out. It was, it was the late tactic. We don't see ever Lysias coming. This is just saying so I could get out of this seat, this hot seat at this point. Because he knows that um, Paul the Apostle is, is fine, he's okay, he hasn't done anything wrong. But he's afraid to make the right decision. And I'm telling you, we're in a, we're in a day and time, it's, it's, it's becoming exceedingly harder to make the right decision. It is. I'm, I'm finding myself in some situations. Because you know the season is to be politically correct. Yeah. Don't, don't say anything that's not politically correct. Just accept it and kind of move on. But some stuff has been burning in my heart. And, and you gotta, you got to hear from the Lord first. And you just got to decide, okay, am I going to let this go or not? But this is the point. Pressure can conform you. And, and you can feel it on the inside, but you just find yourself kind of sitting there or standing there and just not doing anything. This is... Felix at this point, hey, I'm going to wait a little later. Maybe I can get out of this. But God is still in charge. Please note that God is still, even when people compromise, it doesn't throw God off of his plan. Never let it fool you. God is always in charge. Yes, sir. Most times, when you feel pressure, about 88 or 90 percent, it's never the right decision. Everything that you do under pressure actually will not be able to. cause problems. Anybody found that out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can stir up stuff. It stirs stuff in your home. True. True. It'll stir up stuff on the inside of you when you're confronted with truth. I'm telling you, truth affects your life. And Paul the Apostle is the epitome of Christ's salvation and that truth coming forth. Now look as we jump into this. I don't want to deal with it, Felix says. We're going to wait for Lysias, the commander, to get here. So I'm going to read that next verse. Somebody put it in your words. What did he do? House arrest. Tab. Yeah, we we don't want to let you too free, but we want to let your friends come, but we want to keep you under tab. I, I do. I feel that. I feel that's way. Our society is coming, especially when it comes to Christians. Don't talk in, don't talk in Jesus when you're at work. 
but you go on Sunday, you can you can have free, but don't talk too much. Right? Talk to your friends and everything, but when you come back out, um, just kind of conform. You know, don't don't be too different in this whole process. And the same thing for you that says here, keep Paul, let him have some liberty, let his friends come, but don't let him go. He's still in prison, still in jail. Now notice this next part. Someone read. And after some days when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he said to Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Who was supposed to be waiting for him? Lysias, the commander, to come. All right, so a few days, Paul is just kind of going around the area. Friends are visiting him, which also gives us a backstory to some of the epistles, you know, like Luke and others were with him and assisting him. So Paul the Apostle is getting encouraged by those that he's talked to, and now another government official comes in. Now, we're going to learn something about this is God. It has to be God. God is setting up encounters with people who would not have normally come into the presence of God. And this is key and critical. I believe that everyone in the world will have at least one opportunity that they will encounter the presence of God, and they will have to make a choice. Amen. Now God, now, now listen to this, I can go theologically, but I just want to give you this point to think about. God does not have to give any of us a choice. Scripturally, I, I can prove it over and over. I have my colleagues, some of my colleagues disagree with that. He, does, he is not obligated to give us any choice simply because Adam and Eve failed. We were conceived where? In iniquity. We were conceived in iniquity. We were, we were having an eight ball uh, when we were born. That's why we're dying right now. That's why stuff is just messing up, falling apart. And we were already, we were already, we felt it from a birth. We were already down at that, uh, on the way to death. Uh, Brother Winstead said something that shocked me while we were praying, and to get a hold of that, he said, our yesterdays are many, and our tomorrows are few. I was like, oh my God. I hope he talking about himself. I was like, whoo, that was, that was deep. That was, but that's the reality of life, and we don't want to think about that. I mean, who wants to do I guess today has been many, but by tomorrow, it's like, what do you mean? How many tomorrows you got? And so this whole process, but that's death that's been conceived on the inside of us. So we see this whole process here. Now, after some days, Felix came with who? Drusilla. All right, Drusilla. Uh, who was a what? Go God. All right, go God. She has extensive understanding of what's going on, but notice what's happening. She's married into what? What is she married into? Yes, the Roman, the whole Roman thing. So in essence, for her to marry into Felix, it was it was messed up. It was like she was Samaritan of a type. She she married in for. Uh, to get all kinds of perks and things of that sort. So she had issues going on already, but she still had a background of the Jewish knowledge and understanding that they're looking for the Messiah. And that's what happens to you know, some of our kids sometimes. You raise them right, they've been in church, they know about Christ, and then they go get a thug or a thugette. <laughs> you know, you're like, where, where'd that come from? They don't believe this person is an atheist. They, I mean, they, they believe in dogs being God, all this stuff. Like, what happened? They had a background, but they unite for privilege or other things. Notice as we jump into this. Go ahead and read that first uh, part of that commentary, please. Uh, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he I'll let you read. Now, um, what do we learn from this paragraph? <laughs> He's been around, eh? He's been around. He's good at what he does. Okay, so this whole process, we see 
a pattern in his life. As he's sitting there, and I really believe this is what's happening, as he's sitting there listening to Paul, he's getting judged himself. What happens when the judge becomes judged? That's what God will do to you. I can't tell you how many messages I preached, and it was supposed to be for sending, and it turned out to be for me. But really, God does that. It's a two-edged sword goes forward and backwards. So he's sitting there, he's getting judged for his lifestyle, and he knows he knows that is wrong. Look at his next part. Felix and Judean Drusilla had a son, Marcus Antonius Agrippa, who died along with this Drusilla and many of the inhabitants of Pompeii and Herculaneum and the eruption of Mount Vesuvius on the 24th of August, 79, and a daughter, Antonio Clementinia, and the Judean Drusilla was one of only two major figures reported as dying in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, the other being Pliny and the Elder. So we see this is rooted actually in history. Um, my kids are amazed sometimes. You know, we raise them in the Bible and understanding, but when the scriptures that we go through are actually rooted in what they teach in their school, they're like, wow. Especially the college students, they're like, they actually talked about that because this is history. Don't let anybody tell you that this is just made up in fairy tales. No, you can go to other uh, um, historical accounts and get the same history that we have. That's what makes it so powerful. These people are written down in other annals, other things that are outside of just the Holy King James Version Bible, which is very powerful. We see a background of Priscilla also. Notice this next part. After the eruption, Felix married for what? <laughs> She died, and we'll try to keep it moving. Uh, but little is known about his third wife. And all of this comes from Wikipedia. Uh, you can look it up on Google, all of that information. So we see now uh, historical records are merging. We understand the background of Drusilla. We understand the background of Felix also. 24 and 25, so don't read. <coughs> All right, so Lysias, I guess he's still on his way. Um, Felix, wife, Priscilla, they want to talk to him, want to get more information. He's a preacher, though. Not just because he is a preacher, what we would call, but he loves the Lord. He's going to share. What are some of the things he talked about? Righteousness, right standing with God. What else? You think that was my chance? Self-control? Come on, that's three points. Right? Righteousness, self-control. Man, when I start preaching sermons like that, you know it's serious. Righteousness, self-control, judgment. That's what he brings out. So they're listening here at this point, uh, and, and feeling is what? He's afraid. Look at that first part of the commentary. Paul reasoned with this uh, governor and his adulterous wife about righteousness, self-control, the judgment to come. They knew little of personal what? Obviously, we've seen that by the historical records. Even in their public or personal life, they were strangers to self-control, as was witnessed by their present evil marriage. This was a connection by God. God needed Paul the Apostle to stand. Because nobody else could really speak this way uh, to a leader. They would be killed. This is kind of like a John the Baptist moment. When John the Baptist was telling those that were around him, you, that's bad, you're in, a, you're in a messed up marriage. And eventually, his head was cut off for that. This is the same thing. Paul the Apostle, I ain't got nothing to lose anyway. So I may as well be real, let you know what's going on this whole process. So I'm going to go ahead and read that next part of the commentary, please. Go ahead, Cindy. Correct. And that's why we, we kind of led you into this point. I think at this point, God has opened his heart to make a decision, to make a choice. Now, we do see in the scripture that you can get into a reprobate mind. And I think at that point, there's really no turning back. You have refused God over and over again, and you just decided you're going to do what you want to do. And I've actually 
I met a few people like that on their deathbed. Had an opportunity, I ministered to them, and they still refused Christ. What you got to lose? You can ready to die anyway. I mean, they knew that they were going to die, and they still would not accept Christ. They, they were just hard. They were hardened at that point. Uh, and they didn't have any hope. There was no hope of anything in their lives. They weren't looking forward to anything, but they would not reach out and receive the hope of Christ. So we see here at this point, um, decisions have to be made when stress is put on a people in the situation when they know that they're wrong. How many of you knew you were wrong when you were doing what you did? We got about 90%. <laughs> and then the rest are lying. Sit there every day, they part of the conversation. They needed to be warned. Concerned about. We need to warn people. I mean, and oftentimes here in America, I think we take it for granted. I think a majority of people have heard about Christ, have heard about Neil, um, but I think they may not have heard it from a level straight one to one. People talking to them one on one in their face in a loving way. And Paul the Apostle gets this opportunity to share face to face with them. And it, it's something when someone tells you face to face, you know. You're going to go to hell if, if you don't change. That, that, that impacts you from just sitting in a pew and going to a church and hear a preacher preaching. But when someone comes alongside of you and talks to you, there's no doubt. And here's the point that the pressure is being put on. And again, that last part, they would perish in the lake of fire. It's real. The lake of fire is real. You read Revelation, like, it is so, so, so real. You don't want to go there. You don't want to suffer through this life. Go through hell in this life and end up in hell. Amen? Amen. They're so wrong. He's a God of judgment, too. And um, we've got to understand, again, we all have sinned. We all deserve hell, right? Yes. Right? I mean, I guess there's some kids in here who may not raise their hands because of that, but mamas and daddy know they deserve hell too. All the stuff that they did with their little baby and kept us up all night long. We all deserve hell in some sense. Right? Amen. Y'all know it, mamas. You know it when. All of us, we understand every single one of us. So the fact that we have grace in our lives, and we should be excited. We, we should be so thankful that God allowed us to be saved. Yes, ma'am. Good question. There's, there's a lot. We, we've taught on this one time. We see David with his child that um, died because of sin that was in his life. And David said, you know, um, you know, I can't, you can't come to me, but I can go to you. And so they kind of let us know, gave us hope that God is a gracious God, and there is a kind of an age of accountability. That's what you hear in churches a lot of times. But the issue, when I grew up, it was 12. You know, it was like 12, 12, 13. So I, I acted like hell until 12, 13. <laughs> <laughs> hell is in the Bible. It's a biblical word. It's a biblical word. And, you know, and so like, I look at your shot. I'm like, I never heard that word. <laughs> Anyway, so at the age 12, 13, I was like, oh, Lord, I need to get saved. But the issue is that's not because children are understanding so much early. They, I mean, I've I seen some three, four-year-olds. You, you need to get saved because they were processing what they were doing. They understood what they were doing, and they were already making choices at that age. And so I don't think it's a specific age. I think it's just God knows. God knows. Um, we have, you know, kids that were awarded. I believe God's grace covers them. I believe we'll see them in heaven, that whole process. But as far as those who are living, we just don't know what age it is. But I can tell you, because God is a gracious God, everyone will have opportunity. I truly believe that all over the world. Uh, I don't know how he does it, but I really believe that everyone will have an opportunity to receive Christ. Yes, sir. I 
And I, I love that when children truly, they give their testimony. I try to give them an opportunity for them to speak it out. Because I want them to get saved as, as early as possible. I don't want them to have to sow, sow wild oats like y'all. Okay, some of y'all. Right, I mean, seriously, some, some of us are still working through baggage of the past. Just think about we truly got saved, you know, at 10 or 11, how our lives would have been. And I know some of you are like, I did get saved. Okay, you sure didn't act for like it for 15 years. And so, but truly got saved and was trained up, made a disciple. Not saying that you would be perfect, but at least the Holy Spirit would have been powerful enough in you, strong enough to divert you uh, from a lot of that junk that occurred in your life. So this is the process here that we do. We want them to get saved early. So good, good question. Send it. Did it Or you were reading. Go ahead, Deacon and send it. been in church. When I was in the military, some of the worst people had actually been raised up in church, and they had become hard um, um, to the truth. Those who were outside church, man, you can talk to them about Jesus Christ, and they be tender, they start crying. You mean, that's really, that's, our hell is real? But those who brought in church, I don't care, I'm fine, all my friends gonna be in hell, we gonna be part of that. I'm like, really? <laughs> it was just, they had become so hard because they had been doing what they were doing all the time in church, and God didn't kill them. So they started to figure, you know, man, I've been doing this a long time. I've been doing, going to church and singing in the choir, and God didn't kill me. It's all right. Just wait a while. God is just a gracious God. So this whole process we see occurring. Go ahead, Sam. suffering here if you go to heaven. Man, what a wonderful, you, you, you won't even remember all the stuff that you went through. Look at this question because I want us to have some discussion here. Do you believe righteousness, self-control, and the judgment come are emphasized enough in our present day churches? Why or why not? Brother Goins. Uh, I believe either none of them are or else they are. Uh, Or, uh, it's 
depression. All of these things that we go through, and that's a concern uh, of a lot of churches about keeping the pews filled or trying to get more people. So many uh, of, of leaders are want to get more people, want to keep the budget running, all these things. Did you know that, what, what do you think the average number, and those that know this, I told y'all yesterday, what's the average number of church members across America in church? So this, if you take the average number, what is it? Somebody said 250? 125? 100. That is the average. That is the average church if you go to 100 people. Average. So that means you got a whole bunch that's below that, and you got some that are above, but the average is 100. But what do most times we look towards? The people that are on the, the TV and stuff, what do they have? Thousands. Thousands. They are actually, the ones that we listen to and take in, the T.D. Jakes and stuff, they're in the top 1%. That's the top 1%, but oftentimes it's those that have the average churches or below are trying to become 1%. Isn't that crazy? That's like us, you know, our kid ain't never played basketball, and all of a sudden in 12th grade, you say, you know what, I want you to be Michael Jordan. They can't droop. They're not coordinated. And they four foot two. <laughs> For real? I guess there's a slight possibility that that might happen, but all of us know that you got a 1% chance of that it happening. But that's what we drive for in our churches, and because of that, the message that we should be saying is suffering. Russ Ram, Ed Hammond. That's why I think every day, I hear the why. I don't go to other churches unless you go to them first. And I, I feel right. It's the word. The word tells you that you should be there. That's it. A lot of people, you know, they probably say, you know, it's so easy to die for some hard to live. You know, to be saved forever. Well, you know, to be saved forever, that's, that's what will be given to you to follow the word. Yeah, I see a lot of people crazy. A lot of people crazy. I know the people that I talked about the national peace at the end of the day. Amen. Amen. Wow. Yes, sir. I know there's a little bit of separation between the state and the church. But I would say it's time. Maybe I'm trying to give us the same thing we have to do. They're going to try it. I don't think I'm going to be out of it. But it's a good thing. And it's already here, really. Uh, a lot of major uh, denominations, some of the biggest denominations, have already taken that stance. Same-sex marriages. Um, our brothers, our Methodists, uh, their vote's coming up next year. Uh, we need to pray for them. Uh, they're going to make some choices. That political climate is changing so, so quickly. Judgment, righteousness, and self-control. Yes, sir. We brought something and we were out there and kind of and they said, Oh, I got a ticket for that. And a coupon. A coupon. And I said, Oh, and she said, You're so lucky. And I looked at her and said, No, I'm blessed. But she said that she couldn't say that. She couldn't agree with it. Something like that. Because said, of her employment. Because of the employment. So I said, That's the last place I was. Wow. Has it come to that point that I can't say blessed anymore? <laughs> really, I mean, it, and, I, and I can prove it. It is come to that point because some of you on your voice messages, when you leave your voice, you know, nice religious message, have a blessed day, and, and I can tell that it's changing because some of you, you kind of stutter on that. <laughs> you're like, you're like, who gonna call me? Because, you know, I mean, who going to call me? I don't, I don't want to know that I'm really Christian. And so I, I, I call back several years, and then y'all done changed less. Have a nice day. Really, y'all, it, it, the pressure, because you don't want to be, you don't want to be too religious. You don't want people, you know, you don't want to be like, you know, I, we're not here right now. Jesus Christ is Lord, and we just love you. And, you know, self-control, righteousness, and, you know, you're going to hell. And you know, like, nobody wants to listen to that. So we could form a lot of times. And we put these things. But the pressure is coming. 
that even on your job to say blessed or anything, it's like there Jesus, when you just said have a blessed day, people, you already put in uh, a mark on it. Yes, ma'am. Um, I had, uh, I, I'm a prayer stance is very strong. But I've been concerned about when people think, oh, I'll never do that if they'll gossip. Amen. <laughs> no gossip sin in hell too. Yeah. Really, we, we set standards for sin, and it's the same thing. Self-control, righteousness, and judgment. Sin, it's an epidemic that we need the Holy Spirit and salvation to walk through that, and that's what Paul preaches sin. So you preach against homosexuality, but yet you're like Felix and Drusilla. You would do marriage after marriage after marriage. Did I get all the hands? I want to get this next verse. Go ahead and read someone, please. He's afraid, but yet he doesn't submit. So he has ulterior motives. Uh, when that scripture asked Felix hoped that some of Paul's friends would pay him a handsome what? Right. In order to have him released. So he kept talking to him, never made a decision for Christ, but was hoping that he'd get paid. Isn't that amazing how the enemy comes? I mean, we're talking about eternity. We're talking about the riches of heaven, but yet he sells out for the riches of this world. He's not the first, right? No. Who did that? Judas. Judas. How much silver? 30 pieces of silver. He sold out Jesus. How much will it take for you? Yeah. Yeah. about Jesus. And then people are going to go church shopping around 
looking for the best deal for eternity. And we enjoy this. We do this willingly. We never know, you know what Jesus is giving you enough. And so I think many people are concerned sometimes because we're too busy selling Christianity that we don't sell the true of us. True. I'm referring to it. I'm like, hey, you like faith and fellowship or something. You know? it's just, I mean, really, it's just, it's a because it, it's it's too draining. It's too tra- The gospel is what we need. Simple and true. The gospel. You try to please everybody. You're not gonna please everybody. You're not. You're just not. But if you stay with the truth. Stay with the word. You say, God, work it out. God, work work it out in me. Work it out in them. You don't. You don't have to do it, God, because I can't. I, I'm, I'm learning that more and more and more. I can't. Dear God, take it. I'm like Moses. I come down out of the mountain sometimes. Lord, kill them all. <laughs> kill them all. I said, no, hold up. Don't, don't do that. Then God's like, yeah, I kill them. No, God, I'm innocent. Don't kill us. <laughs> it is. It's this, it's this fight, this up and down as we deal with life. But isn't that God? Isn't that Jesus as he works in our hearts and we struggle and we go through? Teeth fall out the tongue, right? Yeah, yeah it does. It does. Yes, sir. Amen. God is that drawing power. Look at that next verse. Someone read, please. But after two years, Porcius, Festus, and Felix, and Felix wanted to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. What's going on? What happened? Uh, there was a change in leadership. <laughs> change in leadership. What happened to poor Paul? How long? I guess it just took Lysias a long time to get there, huh? No, he, it was it was just a ploy. But he can't let him go because the Jewish leaders are looking on him. So now Paul is sitting under house arrest for two years. As we stop on this verse tonight, I want you to study ahead, but I want you to think about what was God doing in Paul's life in those two years. What was God doing in Paul's life for those two years? Because I'm telling you, God never wastes time. He never wastes time. And, and I'll give you a, a key. A lot of it is in the other epistles of the Bible. Paul needed time to hear the voice of the Lord and the right stuff. And he couldn't go nowhere. So because of this sacrifice, God is using him. And think how many other people got saved in this time. So study here, two years, we're going to see. we got to get to Rome, though. we got to get Paul the Apostle to Rome. We're going to be like, all this he's gone through, it'll be okay. You ain't seen nothing yet in Paul's life. Bless his heart. Please study here. Don't forget, next week we have revival. Uh, so be in prayer for that, 7 o'clock each night, uh, starting on Sunday, 8 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 7 o'clock, Monday through Friday. Also pray for um, the Lilly family, uh, Joanne McClendon, Courtney Lilly, uh, their mother passed away, Juanita Lilly, on uh, yesterday. The funeral will be here on Friday, 2 o'clock visitation, 2.30 uh, will be the funeral. Also pray for Mother Harrison, uh, Doris Harrison, her nephew passed away. Uh, real close to the family, so pray for them also. Amen. Yeah. Come on to your feet. Let's close out.